Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I hope you all are having a beautiful, wonderful Saturday, this last Saturday in the month of April. Uh, thank you again for joining us. This is your Health is Wellness for April. We are really, really excited about our guest today. Um, looking forward to speaking with Dr. Alif, uh, who is uh, the ch Chief Science Advisor for LeafWell. Um, if you all are not already familiar with LeafWell, get to know them. You can visit their website at leafwell.com. If you're living in a state and you don't know how or where to find your medical card, they are a great organization, great company that is helping patients all throughout the country to do that. Um, and so we, we are so grateful that they decided to join us today for this month, for April's month of Health is Wellness. So thank you again for taking your time out on your Saturday to spend a few minutes with us. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful conversation. Uh, and so I want to go ahead and get it started because right after this, I have to host an expungement clinic here in Arizona. So um, I would like to introduce our guest today, <clears throat> Dr. Alif. If you would please join us. Uh, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate hello, hello. it. Hi, Dr. Alif. Uh-oh, you, you can't hear me. Oh, goodness. Right. I hear you. I hear you. You, you can hear me? Able to hear me? Yes, I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, I hear you fine. Uh, Roz, how do I okay, sound? Good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. I hope you all can hear me. Uh, but Dr. Alif, thank you so much for being here. It's so great to have you. Well, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you for um, the invitation. Of course, of course. So let's just jump in and um, get started. Could you please let us know um, how you got involved with natural medicine um, and uh -huh. and and uh, understanding um, that natural products uh, have better options for patients? How did how did you get into that? Well, um, I started out with natural medicine before I ever went to medical school or even before I went to high school. Um, my mother and father both attended uh, historically black colleges uh, in Kentucky. It used to be called Kentucky State College, and they uh, were both uh, public school teachers. So my home environment was always full of lots of education and learning. That was like the most important thing because that's how they got out of the, let's call them socioeconomic situations that they had grown up in to create better lives for themselves and obviously for us as their children. One factor that was very important to my mother and father was to teach my brother and I about prominent uh, African Americans in the, in the current time and also historically. And one of those people was George Washington Carver. And so I always loved chemistry as a kid growing up. And George Washington Carver did a lot of chemistry in the food and, and medicine space, but most of us, if you go back a generation or two, um, our first medicine came from the earth. It came from plants. It came from eating soil to get minerals. Lots of things that modern medicine might tell you that you shouldn't do actually were how people stayed healthy and often healthier than people are today. So that was when I was, you know, seven or eight years old, long before I went to you know, medical school. I didn't get to medical school till I was 21. And yet there's a very impressive record here. Um, not, you've attended Harvard and Stanford. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, and and what was that experience like? Um, going to those schools, to these to these prominent universities, with the frame of mind that you wanted to learn more about natural medicine. Was that a very opening environment at the time there? Well, yeah, actually it was because when I was there, there wasn't yet the conflict between natural medicine and kind of corporate or mainstream medicine. Because like I said, my interest primarily was uh, chemistry. That was my, I've always loved molecules in that whole perspective and I still carry that forward. But um, my, um, my mother, I only had her for a few years. She passed away from cancer, metastatic cancer when I was 11. And for the last three years of her life, she was in the hospital mostly. And so I spent a lot of time with her in the hospital because that would be the only place that I would see her. And that affected me a lot. But part of the way that it affected me was in recognizing 
there was something missing. You know, I was only eight years old, nine years old, but I could tell that there was something missing in the way that they were treating her. It wasn't that they were mistreating her, but it's just, you know how when you're a kid, things are intuitive because you don't have all the intellectual information and all that to say, oh, they're not giving the appropriate dosage or whatever. And, and I, but what I did see was here's this vital woman who was a leader in our church, who had a green belt in judo, who has had a master's degree in education and had a career as a teacher and was kind of a prominent community leader at the time who suddenly couldn't get out of bed. You know, her, her body was shrinking away. She couldn't walk without a walker in the last few years of her life. And so, but that wasn't the cancer. That wasn't the cancer doing that. People often think that that's the cancer doing all of those things. Um, but it was the treatments, the radiation therapy, the chemotherapy. And I didn't know those details, obviously, until later. But when I went to college, I wanted to study cancer research. And so natural products is really the origin of most medicines. And so in, in that space, that's, that's where I started. That's what the work was that was available in cancer at Harvard. Um, this modern trend towards synthetics is really just a, is a later, it's a fad, I guess I would say. <laughs> it's lasted for about 20 years, but, you know. Yes. It's, uh, understanding, it, it, understanding. It, it, it's a. Once you understand what chemotherapy is, what these, what, what these um, yeah. radiation therapies are, um, going in and killing all the cells versus, you know, actually going into the body and attacking unhealthy cells versus healthy cells. Um, right. that's, that's not what it does. Uh, but the plant we know now no. on cellular level, the cannabis plant and the compounds in the cannabis plant do that, do exactly that. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit more yes. about your yes. cannabis research in regards to cannabis, the plant and, and plant medicine? How, mm -hmm. how, how has that evolved? Sure. So um, an important thing to a couple of important things, much of the time, the people, the doctors that are treating cancer haven't studied cancer. They've studied oncology, which is a little bit different. So I started studying cancer when I was still in college as an undergraduate at Harvard before I went to medical school and took courses in cancer biology and understanding what is actually going on inside of a human being when they have cancer. Most people that are oncologists, their study of cancer really primarily begins, their focus on cancer, I should say, begins after they finish medical school, after they finish their basic training as an intern and in internal medicine, and then they decide to specialize in oncology instead of say something else that they could specialize in like cardiology or endocrinology. And so it's like an afterthought. And they may do a fellowship and all those things, but you know how adults are, the older you get, the busier you get, the less time most people have for learning and, and especially the less humility most of us have to start from the basic ABC fundamentals of something. So I've traveled all around the world giving lectures on uh, cancer, both from the standpoint of prevention and from the standpoint of, of treatment to national cancer hospitals in different countries as far away as Indonesia, the Royal Society of Medicine here in the US. And one of the things I found is much of the time the cancer surgeons and the oncologists really aren't aware of what goes on with cancer at molecular level. They're dealing with a disease as opposed to the disease process. And so as you mentioned, yes, the cancer treatments tend to be toxic. And because I spent so much time in that space, you know, it's kind of, you know, a lot of times, a lot of me, myself, when I go to sleep at night, I'm still thinking about what I did during the day. And so I'm going to sleep thinking about cancer, but it, it leaves time for different sorts of thoughts to be in your mind as opposed to the nine to five day to day things. And what I came to realize is that the Western medicine approach to cancer is very much like, mm, for lack of a better term, medieval. Yeah. So if you yeah. look at that perspective, cancer is treated as an evil inside of the person. And as soon as they have that evil inside of them, right. that person becomes evil, right? Because, you know, like on TV, if somebody's a vampire or somebody's a murderer <laughs> or whatever, they no longer Joe, who, you know, is a teacher at the local school, that's Joe the murderer or Jane the cancer patient. 
Yes. And you know, the cancer in a person is about this big. Yes. It's not a, it's not even a pound. Right. right. One pound cancer would be devastatingly huge. <laughs> okay. Right. Most right. of us weigh over a hundred pounds as adults. Right. And right. so why does that little thing define little the ounce, entire person? A couple so of grams. A lot of it has right. to do it has to do with the mentality and the philosophy that underpins this culture. And so how do people historically in Western culture approach eradicating evil? It's like exorcism, like that movie, The Exorcist. And so whatever you need to do historically, like in the with witches, which most of the time were women that were either midwives or healers, but they had these powers to help people and to change their lives. And was it, you know, was men it don't always like that. Or was it spells, right? Was it them putting a bunch of herbs inside of a pot and 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 speaking words over it? <laughs> well, the, the, the thing is, when you don't know how somebody does something, it always looks like magic, like people exactly. often mention in science fiction. Exactly. Anybody yeah. who has technology that you don't understand, it looks like it's magic. It's magic, and, right, right. And so, you know, the, the whole creation of modern medicine, part of it was taking that practice away from women and giving it to men and the development of, of medicine in as it's called Western medicine in Western Europe was primarily around supporting the military and the aristocracy. It wasn't available really for people. You go back to the 1600s, 1700s and all of that. But anyway, you know, the classic thing in a witch trial was it's like, okay, this woman is possessed. We're going to strap her to this iron chair and push her into the ocean. If she floats, She's a witch and will burn her. If she sinks, well, she wasn't a witch, thank goodness, and now her soul is with the Lord. Either way, the woman's dead, right? Oh my God. And so it's the same sort of thing. The philosophy in cancer therapy is to give these toxic treatments and poisons to a human being and hope that they survive and hope that you kill the cancer before you kill the person. And I was just right. reading something yesterday that showed a study in Britain that showed that 25% of cancer patients die of the treatment and the problem is in in in, in places like the uk um there are children that are suffering mm -hmm. right now because they don't have access to cannabis as medicine it's been right. proven that right. the cannabis is helping said diagnosis um but the, the 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 hoops that they are putting the parents and the families through just to have access to the medicine is criminal in my mind it doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense yes um, it is can you, can you it tell is. It, 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 it's either criminal or, or it's business. That, I'm not sure both. which one. <laughs> either, either way, either way. For, you're for not a lot of people, once business. you call something business, it right. makes everything okay. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, 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 and what we have to understand that these people are in this business for profit, not for the people. Um, and, and we have to mm -hmm. understand that right. it's the same concept when it comes to this plant. They've known for generations that this plant right. is a medicine. They've known that. We've right. proven that. That's why the United right. States government owns a patent on right. cannabidiol, um, noise, owns a patent on cannabidiol right. that says it's a neuroprotectant. They've owned right. that patent since 1999. So w there's no question of what this right. plant can do, but because it cannot yet profit right. the pharmaceutical companies, it cannot yet profit the government to to allow people to grow their medicine. Um, then they forbid us from doing it. Um, and and can you tell me uh, because Leafwell is such a fascinating um, uh, organization, fascinating company. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate what they're doing. Um, what drew you to the company? How did you find your partnership as um, chief science advisor for Leafwell? How did that come about? Well, you may have noticed because we're connected on on LinkedIn. I do a fair amount of posting of articles and information on LinkedIn. And so much of the time, uh, companies I end up working with actually find me through LinkedIn. And so, for instance, years ago, uh, I was the chief science officer for uh, Charlotte's Web, and they also found me through LinkedIn because it's kind of, you know, people are spread out all over the world these days. And, and how do you find somebody, especially that's an expert in cannabis and and the pharmacology of cannabis, there's not like a you know directory anywhere. So most of those connections uh, that I generate come through LinkedIn, and it's the same thing with Leepo, the CEO, identified me and and thought that I could contribute to their work, their mission of optimizing 
access to cannabis uh, for human beings in, in general. So that's for people that have, you know, medical conditions. That's for people that have medical conditions but don't yet understand the potential benefits of cannabis. So part of it is also educational. And as I mentioned, you know, both of my parents were teachers. I grew up in that, you know, sort of uh, legacy and and you know before I I was a teacher before I ever went to college I started teaching when I was 14 years old and oh, so same. that's to I me that's teaching, the most important part of medicine I started teaching swim lessons when I was around that age that was my first job I was a lifeguard and swim instructor um I was swimming was something I could do before I could walk coming from two West Indian parents so uh, I was yeah. definitely patterned all right there you go pool. Um, before I even learned how to actually take my first steps. Um, and so when, when, when it came time to find a summer job, it was really easy. It was just, it, I was drawn right to um, doing something that I knew I already knew how to do. Um, I just had to get the formal training for it. And, and therefore I, I, I got a job. Um, but with LeafWell, can you tell us a little bit more about what the company is and what they do? What is the service that they provide um, for their communities, for the consumers? So LeafWell is present present in multiple states around the United States. And as the listeners probably know, each state has its separate guidelines and legal structure for access to cannabis, you know, whether it's available for medical use only, whether it's available for what's called recreational use, uh, what conditions may or may not be included as being authorized. But in general, um, it can be very confusing and what leafwell does is provides a team of uh of highly trained physicians to help people through that process from being interested in seeing what cannabis can do for them uh therapeutically to walking through the process which primarily just involves a medical interview to confirm does this person have a particular condition like low back pain migraine uh, you know, post-cancer pain, uh, anxiety, PTSD, you know, there are several conditions that are indicated with respect to cannabis. And so then once that physician in the interaction, which is usually a virtual telemedicine interaction, um, like you and I right now, and then to find out what that person's condition is, and then it's up to the physician to decide uh, whether or not this given patient then qualifies. And then once that certification is made, then in each state, there's a different process, but in general, within a week or so, two weeks, uh, it, it varies from state to state, and that person will receive their uh, medical marijuana card. And the benefit of the medical marijuana card, there, there are a couple of benefits for people, and you may know more than I do, perhaps, uh, but one is the financial uh, benefit in most states, the product that are purchased by a medical marijuana patient cost less because this tax structure is less, that sort of a thing. But also for a lot of people, I think there's still a great deal of stigma associated with cannabis and medical marijuana. And it helps people to be able to say, look, you know, I'm serious about this. You know, I'm doing this for my medical condition, you know, not just to have a good Friday night or some sort of thing like that. And, you know, lots of times dispensaries tend to be more shifted in the, you know, recreational zone, uh, as it would be called, because that's, you know, 90 plus percent of their business. And so it's not necessarily medically oriented. And I'm working to help to some dispensaries change that, and, especially and here in my home all, state of, of Washington. Do you all um, do you all help the patient decide or determine what form of the medicine to use? For example, if you're dealing with a cancer patient, um, then you're not going to probably recommend any edibles that have a bunch of sugar in them. Um, but if you're dealing with someone that maybe has some breathing issues, right there, they might not want a, a product that they have to smoke. Mm -hmm. So are you also educating the consumer or the patient on how on the different forms of using the plant um, and as, as well as what their options might be in that regard and, and making sure that they understand, you know, onset and duration, those kind of things. <laughs> so, uh, no, that's an excellent question, Nicole. So, as you know, this country, this culture and its culture of medicine doesn't really allow that much time in the interaction with physicians in general. And so one of the things that I'm bringing to LeafWell 
is an enhanced uh, dashboard of available information, both what's available online as far as things that people can read, studies, statistics, that sort of thing, but also, uh, you know, events, webinars like this one to engage directly with medical marijuana patients or to present information as well for physicians because, you know, physicians aren't trained in medical cannabis in medical school. There's no specialty training um, in the pharmacology of cannabis or the endocannabinoid system, which is the endogenous system within the human body, a physiologic system that is responding to the feeding of that system with cannabis, kind of like giving vitamins to your bones and muscles and you know liver and kidneys, that sort of thing, that cannabis That's is right. in some ways like a vitamin for the endocannabinoid system. So right. there's a there's a a long kind of process of educating both the health professional community and also the patients. But for me it's a great thing because I grew up in, in Detroit and you know, and my family, not just me, but my family was also African American. And uh, which is, you know, these days you have to make that distinction. You can't assume anymore, right? Because That's people right. are being raised That's by right. all sorts of different people. That's right. And and so one of the things, because my parents I, I don't tend to talk about poverty as a disadvantage or a victimization because they never presented it that way. But as we mentioned in the phone call that we had, you know, my mother grew up in, in like a shanty town house with chickens running around the yard and, and her four sisters and her mom, my dad used to joke about that he and his mother um, moved every time the rent was due and that apparently his father wasn't around that much. And, but one of this thing of living at that level that then they went on to get college degrees and even graduate degrees, they both had master's degrees in education but it was very important to them to always respect individual human beings. And my father used to write stories and poetry. And he had this one story that was called Willie and the Graduate. And it was about this guy who had left the hood, you know, kind of thing, gone off to college, gotten his degree, was walking around with his, you know, graduate hat on, coming back to the neighborhood. And he was being disrespectful to his old friend Willie that he had grown up with. And Willie was like, well, you know, you've learned all this stuff in college, but that doesn't mean you really know about life. And it was very important to my parents that, you know, I need to know about life because life happens every time you put on a hoodie as a young African-American male. That's and right. it doesn't matter how much you understand calculus and pharmacology, you know, that people aren't necessarily judging you by the content of your character yet. And but right. so it was always important to be able to connect to people at whatever level they're at, because you can learn something from anybody on the street even somebody who is homeless may not be educated and maybe even have a substance abuse problem but that person is still alive and doing their day-to-day -day thing and you know if i didn't have any food i wouldn't know where to find food so i can That's learn right. something from a homeless person and <laughs> you know so so it's like why would i shut off this brain if i can comprehend harvard and stanford and calculus and pharmacology why would I not also expand that into all these other realms of humanity? So my focus is to be able to educate people exactly where they are with the level of knowledge they that they have. Absolutely. And I like the flat playing field because a lot of patients know more about cannabis than the physician. So I that's don't talk right. down to patients because that, that's my you family. Have to meet them. You have to meet them where they are. And it's not talking yeah. down as much as it is no, just making sure that they understand um, and, right. you know, because when we start talking about phytocannabinoids and the endocannabinoid <laughs> system, sometimes we lose people. I can see like the, the glaze comes over their eyes. They're like, you lost me at endo. I don't understand what else you said after right. that. Um, and so right. it's, you have to try to explain it to them in, in the best way that they uh, they can understand um, that the compounds found in this plant, the DNA of this plant can help to manage and mitigate your symptoms of your disease better. Can 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 make sure that you can come off of opioids. Can make sure that you can safely come off of any type of drug addiction. Um, I know that this plant has mm -hmm. been put into the category of a dangerous drug, but you actually got lied to. It's not that. It's medicine. Um, and so having to change the way that people think about the plant, I I completely understand. As an advocate, um, it's something that I'm doing daily and constantly. 
So while we have the moment, um, could you kind of go over mm -hmm. with us what are the most common ways of cannabis um, um, uh, usage? Can you share with us? Um, mm -hmm. You know, usually there's about four sure. that come to mind automatically. Can you share with us what are those most common ways of usage? And then also, what are their onset? What are their duration? So how long that means? How long does it take? <laughs> for it to, I, I know I'm not. I'm explaining this to you, but I'm really explaining mm -hmm. it for our audience. When I say onset, oh no no no, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. When I say onset, I mean yes, how yes, long does it yes, take yes. before it actually becomes into effect? Um, once you take it, and then also the duration, mm -hmm. of course, meaning how long does that high or how long does the effects of the medicine medicine last? Okay, so when, just quickly before I address that to address something you just said about that cannabis being classified as a dangerous drug. With an open mind, I could say, yes, it is a dangerous drug because it's dangerous to pharmaceutical company profits. And so from that perspective, it's very dangerous and people protect their own interests. And there are already studies that show a great decrease in the use of both opioid drugs and what are called benzodiazepines, which are common anti-anxiety uh, drugs, both of which, of course, are psychotropic. People think that cannabis is the only thing that's psychotropic, but uh, the opioids and these benzodiazepines. And so the safety profile of cannabis is much greater than, say, benzodiazepines and opioids because you won't find people on the street having used, quote unquote, too much cannabis and they can no longer breathe and die. That's what happens with opioids. The same thing That's with right. benzodiazepines and people easily become addicted to the drug and keep taking it, not because it's still helping them, but because they can't stop without going through withdrawal. So, um, right. so there, there is a danger in the sense of being disruptive to the status quo um, and the danger also that people, especially in the states where people are allowed to grow their own cannabis, that in, is, you know, endangers the, the business opportunities, the people that would rather make money off of people's illness uh, than necessarily see them get over their disease uh, or condition on their own and be able to manage it on their own. So, you know, there's a history, you know, for instance, you know, China was invaded because they had closed their country to Western business. When the Western business came back to London to Parliament and they said, they're not going to let us go sell our products there. And we need to send gunboats up the river and conquer that country because, you know, they're standing in the way of business. So that's just history. That's just right. Western culture right. history. We and the United follow, States participated in that, too. Follow the money. Yeah. Follow so the money. The, that's always what yep. it comes to. The Roosevelt, the, Roosevelt funny, the Roosevelt family made historically made their uh, fortune to become a very wealthy, prominent family by selling opium in China to subjugate the population. So, you know, that's just, just I say these things so that people understand the, the, the dynamics, the forces that are at work. So Absolutely. to your question about cannabis and the different modes. So, you know, cannabis, uh, typically people consume it, there are multiple modes, but you can think of it as what's being ingested as far as it goes into the mouth to be swallowed or under the tongue, though that sort of route. Um, there's also the inhaled route. Um, primarily, there's also additionally what is called topical, which means it's not put in the mouth or inhaled, but it's put on the surface of the body somewhere. And then also there are suppositories that can be, and I'm gonna use doctor talk, that can be vaginal or rectal uh, suppositories. Um, and they have a, a different, dynamic as well with anything that a person takes into their body uh it it varies um how what the route is of, of ingestion smoking a cigarette is different than smoking a cigar which is different than chewing tobacco because when people chew tobacco they don't inhale it it's they usually don't swallow it not supposed to but it gets soaked into the tissues of the mouth and the different chemical components of tobacco enter the body that way. And the person receives their psychotropic effect that they get from tobacco in that way. Inhaled, the smoke goes into the lung with a cigarette. And when smoke goes into the lung or anything goes into the lung, whether it's smoke, if it's vapor from a vape pen or e-cig, or if it's just air pollution from some place like Los Angeles, all of that goes into the lungs. And from the lungs, it gets distributed into the bloodstream. And then once it goes into the bloodstream, it can go all over the body. 
Okay, and so difference with cigars is cigars also are not supposed to be inhaled and you can actually absorb nicotine, uh, cigar smoke and pipe smoking are very different from cigarette smoking in that people are supposed to do what's called insufflate. They suck the smoke into the mouth and hold it there without inhaling it into the lungs and then blow it back out. But tobacco is a potent enough medicine. It's also a medicinal plant and it was used very differently by the Native Americans here before it was commercialized by the colonizers from, That's right. from Europe. That's right. um, and so a lot of these natural medicines have been turned into dangerous products um, because of the culture of so-called refinement, purification, and also just this intense consumer culture that is at the core of this modern culture civilization that we live in. Tobacco by itself is not dangerous. The coca plant by itself, as it's used traditionally in the Andes Mountains, it's used in much the same way that coffee is. Coffee is a psychotropic medicinal plant that is addictive, and it's addictive in ways that cannabis is not. It's just regulated differently. Well, so if you were to extract the, audience, the caffeine... Remind the audience um, sure. th th that um, you've got uh, cocoa, um, a plant, uh, mm -hmm. That is native to the to the right. uh, to a very tribal and tropical regions of the earth, um, and that is where co the cocaine right. comes from. Um, it, it has to be processed, of course, right. out of the plant in, in order to create um, the, the the drug, the street drug that you that you know of. But that right. is where cocaine comes from. Right. It comes from the cocoa plant. Um, it is a processed form of a, a, an yeah. extract that comes from there. Um, and, and and so thank you yeah. for thank you for that information. I, I I'm not sure if you did transdermal yet. Did you talk right, can about? I, can I mention one little thing? Yeah, sure. One 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 little thing. It's helpful because it also pertains to cannabis. So when this culture of like Western science engages a natural product, there's this tendency to try and reduce it down to these individual components, molecules, minerals, that sort of thing. When we do that, we change the experience of it. You know, when you reduce sugar cane to white crystalline sugar, that's when it starts causing cavities. When you reduce coke, uh, you produce cocaine, white crystalline cocaine or crack from this green leafy plant that grows in the mountains and in the rainforest, that's when you have this addictive abuse problem. If you did that with coffee and you extract the caffeine, from coffee, it's also a white crystalline substance. And some people do snort it and you can have strokes and heart attacks from that. So it's not the plant's fault. It's the culture and mentality of people using and if you will, abusing it. And so the same thing can happen with cannabis where people try to extract the certain components from that that they believe are the principal or the active compound, like say for instance, THC. Well, THC is only the active compound of cannabis if you, a person is focused on the intoxication, on the getting high part, but that's not what the plant is designed for. It has lots of different uses. It just happens to be associated with that because of the 1960s and 70s and, and some and propaganda you, and all of these sorts of things. If you don't decarboxylize it, if you don't, if you don't activate right. the THC compound it, for in the natural plant, it is not intoxicating. Right. It is not psychotropic at all. So Zero leave, exactly. If you if you leave it in its natural state, then it has much more medicinal benefits and you, you don't get the high yes. from it. And it's not saying that the high is a right. bad thing. That's not what I'm associating with no. THC. All I'm saying is that, that that it has been given a negative connotation because of its effects, psychotropic effects. But in its natural state, right. that is not how the plant that is not what THC does. Um, and so let me ask you this, um, Dr. Alif, um, do, do you think mm -hmm. that. Um, do you think that uh, that there is a way for us um, and in what ways maybe has Leafwell um, made a commitment to underserving communities to help people get their MMJ cards, their medical marijuana cards is what I'm referring to. Um, it, wh what do you think mm -hmm. is the best way? What is the best campaign for us as advocates and you as a physician, as a professional um, to try to get more people of color, these same communities that have been marginalized? Um, that have been left out of the cannabis industry, have been criminalized and demonized for using the plant all these years. Um, what is the best way to bring them back into this understanding that, yes, this plant is medicine, and yes, this plant can offer 
real benefits for you and your family, not just um, physically and not just but also spiritually, also economically. Um, how do we bring those those communities mm -hmm. back into the fold? What What do you think is the best route for us in that way? And and is the, is Leafwell doing anything to to kind of help with that process? Sure. So I believe that the best way is through uh, small businesses that are run by people from these same communities and therefore understand the community that they're in because when it comes to cannabis um, having a cannabis dispensary that represents a community is much like having a medical clinic that is run by people that represent the community and connect with that community on a, on a much deeper level than just as a nine to five job with cannabis, there is this disconnect because of the odd regulations. And so a person gets a medical marijuana card over here, they go to a dispensary over there, but that dispensary is not able to talk to the medical marijuana card physician because there's a barrier for physicians when it comes to actually managing a patient who's taking medical marijuana. There's all sorts of weird politics in there. And so but in working with dispensaries and also with activists like yourself, uh, people that are knowledgeable in the field, um, we can work to provide, for instance, you know, uh, information sessions like this to help people understand the plant beyond the stigma and the propaganda, but to really understand what's going on, to really understand that, you know, cannabis is a medicine, but I would take it further to think of it as a functional food, as a basic nutrient that's been missing. Because when you have undernourished people, if they're not getting the right vitamins, they come down with diseases like, you know, scurvy. And, and so right. there are diseases. Scurvy used to kill more people, you know, lack of vitamin C used to kill more people than cancer. And when the cure to scurvy was discovered, by the British historically, they hid it from the rest of the world <laughs> because lots of soldiers, again, remember I told you, medicine and war, soldiers um, would die of scurvy and it was uh, common for you know a significant percent, 10, 15, 20% of these young healthy soldiers that are marching off, say England to do battle with the French, Napoleon, all that, that 15% of them may die between when they leave the barracks and when they make it to the battlefield because you know they're on foot they're not on horses horses are for the aristocrats and when it was found that there's a way of treating this scurvy and when you're sending these sailors out in boats to go uh capture and deal in the trade of slaves in west africa and bring them over to the new world that these people that are out at sea if you start losing sailors then you're losing business and when they found that uh that certain plants would block this progression of scurvy. Supposedly it was started with eating of grass, just regular grass, like on your lawn grass. It wasn't even citrus fruits or any of that because the understanding of vitamins didn't exist for another hundred years. At that point, um, right. But yeah. when they found that, they kept it a secret. It was a nationally guarded secret that if you divulge that secret to people of other countries, you could be executed as a traitor. So follow the that, prophet. Follow the money. Follow the money. Yeah. So, but if, if you don't get enough vitamin C, you can't make hair, bone, skin, fingernails, blood vessels, all sorts of things that to us we take for granted because we're kind of overloaded with food these days. It's not always the most nutritious, but to the extent to which um, Americans tend to overeat, it's very unlikely that someone is going to end up with vitamin C deficiency. So, we don't actually right. have a chance to see what that looks like. And so cancer seems very scary, but vitamin C deficiency is basically unknown. You've never even studied it in medical school. I just happen to study it because I, I like to know the connections between the society, its history, its business and military and political interests and what happens and to the people medicine. that are caught in the middle medicine. of that and their That's health. Right. And yeah. so this is the same thing with cannabis that you mentioned raw, fresh cannabis, not having any THC, that it just has the primary form, the THCA, which is not uh, intoxicating, right. that right. if someone was to juice fresh cannabis, especially like say they grew it in their garden, that's really a green juice food, yeah, but it absolutely. would still provide the same and in many ways more of the healing benefits, 
of then the burn helping to prevent or, inflammation or, or the curated yes. fiber. and so a lot of the problems that people have yeah 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 that's yeah. right um, and so and for, Sebi, that's what i tend to advocate first even even dr sebi says that um the cannabis plant is an alkaline plant um and and he's talking about it in its natural raw form right it it, it has more alkaline mm -hmm. properties yeah. in that form than when you burn it or when you cook it or decarboxylize it. oh yeah um so uh, in our last yep. few minutes um before we wrap up and leave out of here um i want to thank everyone for joining us again this saturday but i just want to do a few quick questions um uh, that you could answer for me so we could get to know you can just I, a little bit better nicole yeah i just one quick thing before you go yes. to this question because you mentioned before cancer and we left it behind I'm going yes, to post this on LinkedIn sometime this week. Yes, but of course. Here's a thing for people to consider when they're thinking about ca uh, cannabis for cancer specifically. Yes, sir. Don't worry about the science. Don't worry about the clinical trials and all that. Just consider what the side effects are that are commonly openly associated with cancer treatment Chemo and the side effects that are associated with cannabis. Right. And the side effects associated with cannabis are so small and minor that to deny someone ca uh, cannabis when they're under treatment for cancer really doesn't make any sense. It's like saying we don't want you to drink milk or we don't want you to have a green salad. It really is not even logical. So it's not about does cancer, does cannabis kill cancer? I'm not trying to kill cancer. I'm trying to restore people's bodies because the body is what kills the cancer. Cancer, when the chemistry right. of the drugs and the radiation therapy kill the cancer, like you said, it also, excuse me, kills uh, healthy, healthy normal cells. cells. And that's what happened that's to right. my mother. That's right. So, but it's really about supporting the body in its own wisdom and its own vital power to resist disease. And whether that disease starts with a C like cancer or a C like COVID, uh, it has an addiction like cocaine, all of these things, a lot of this is because what's missing inside of this drives people to these addictions to to habits and to if you will infirmities illnesses a lot of it just begins with stress anxiety and depression and one other term that people may not be as familiar with which is inflammation and cannabis addresses all of those if you emulate eliminate the inflammatory problem that can lead to cancer that can lead to heart attack that can lead to stroke that can lead to inflammatory bowel disease that can lead to metabolic syndrome and diabetes. If you normalize that in the body, a good 80% of the chronic diseases that people take medications for and the medications will go away, sicker, will disappear. That, it, uh, That's it's right. gone. It's That's gone. gone. Right. Don't even have the disease. You can't even find the disease in your body anymore. Um, once you give the body what it yeah. needs to heal, it will heal itself. That's what the body does. Um, well, you answered my That's first couple job. of questions. I was going to ask for words of advice or pearls of wisdom. So you gave mm -hmm. us that. We really appreciate you talking how passionate you are about cancer and cannabis and, and just plant medicine <laughs> in general. So thank you for sharing that. Um, can you share with us maybe any future sure. projects that you might have um, that are coming up that you want the folks to know about? Sure. So I'm working with some other uh, dispensaries, as I mentioned. So later, maybe in a week and a half, uh, I have a web webinar coming up with a dispensary that's in New Jersey. And again, working to help people to understand how cannabis can benefit them. And probably the thing that I can do the most, what I'm promoting kind of nationwide, worldwide, is this concept of therapeutic cannabis not medical and not recreational. Those are categories that the legislators created and lots of people like those categories. I don't, okay? If they don't call coffee recreational, right? And right. recreational makes it sound like, you know, oh, you're just kind of playing around and you don't really care what happens. And so in that therapeutic space, somebody may be, if you will, smoking a joint when they come home from work to decrease that stress level after being in commuter traffic or on public transportation so that they're not a crazy man or woman with their spouse, their kids or whatever, so that they can actually be the, the kind of person that they would choose to be. Okay. Present. That is a therapeutic Functional. use, but they may yeah. not have a qualifying medical condition. Right. Okay. And, and so I encourage people to understand that therapeutic includes things like massage and yoga, both of which have been shown to support the endocannabinoid system, which we unfortunately have enough time to go into. But this process that 
And also somebody who's using medical marijuana uh, for say their cancer, it doesn't mean that they may not light up on a Saturday and just hit that just to chill and go for a walk in the park. And there's nothing right. wrong with that because if they can have a shot of bourbon, if they can have a glass of wine, if they can make love, if, I mean, what's wrong with pleasure? Oh, that's right. That's this culture, isn't it? It's like trying to get people <laughs> to stay in that stress mode. Cause you know, when people get real relaxed, sometimes they look at their life and they say, you know, I have a dream <laughs> and, and you gotta have, you gotta have enough space and composure. Yes. Some people yes. find it through prayer. Some people find it through gospel singing, that, right. you know, singing that's in a choir right. has been shown to enhance the health of the endocannabinoid system. That's right. Um, that's right. But then people make different decisions. That's why it's called psychotropic. That's because right. psychotropic means the mind turns. And as that mind turns, you see things from a different perspective. Perspective. And you might that's realize right. you don't right. have to live on the bottom end of, of everything. And <laughs> right. you don't have to put up with abusive relationships. It's no longer, you're no longer even connected to it. Press. It doesn't even work. That's right. You don't have to, you know, the body at disease, disease, y'all, the body at right. dis ease. Yeah. So when, so when you put the body at ease and you relieve some of that anxiety and stress, your body starts functioning better. It's simple science. Um, right. And and so right. it, with your future project that you're working on, um, let us know how we can get in contact with you, how we can help or support you with, with the work that you're doing. What is the best way for the audience to, to kind of reach out and, and, um, and pick your brain some more? <laughs> the best way to find me, I would say, is, is LinkedIn. I don't have a, a website because... Okay. I'm, I'm a little bit too nerdy. I'm always, I spend all day reading and doing things. And <laughs> I allow other people that are much more kind of charismatic like you to help <laughs> present me to, to the world. But I am definitely present on LinkedIn. And okay. I say things sometimes that people don't expect me to say. I made a post last week showing people that Viagra and the other drugs like that are really used as recreational drugs. If you're going to talk about recreational marijuana, you should start talking about recreational Viagra. That's I have right. an upcoming post showing people that drugs like ibuprofen and Tylenol that people use for pain, they're psychotropic drugs. They actually That's have documented right. psychotropic effects. That's so right. I, I want people to understand the reality, to understand the truth so that they can make wise decisions for themselves, to understand that cannabis is not a dangerous drug. You can drink too much water. I know, I know a patient who got in trouble drinking too much water because his doctor, a friend of mine, says he was in the emergency room and he was dehydrated. And the doctor said to him, he's like, yeah. And he's like, well, you know, doc, anything else I need to do? And he says, drink water, drink as much as you can. And the guy took it to heart <laughs> and he drank as much water as he could. <laughs> and he drank so much water that he got sick and he was in the hospital. I don't have wow. time to explain how water makes you sick, but right. also water but is I psychotropic. Know uh, but I know that you, I've heard this before, that you can definitely do too much water in a short period yeah. of time and flood your yeah. kidneys and, and, and it can be kind of dangerous for your bladder. It imbalances, and your yeah. it imbalances the body. Yeah, in that's nature, right. nobody has access to water that just gushes out in general, you know, nobody's right, going right. to go drink a whole river. You don't see a bear drinking the whole river. Right. You know? right and uh, right, right. also the water that most people drink is municipal water. And, and so municipal it's, got, it's water is recycled. Right. And, it, yeah. and it's filled with there's chemicals it's like pesticides. There's also drugs. Yes. There's also that's drugs. Right. There's pharmaceutical drugs and recreational. All, all kinds so of chemical waste, drugs. all that kind of stuff. It's yes. all it's all really? in the water. And, the water that and, people in New York City are drinking today was in somebody's toilet yesterday. That's right. That's right. And you don't that you can't tell people that's in New just, York that, especially in the Bronx. They swear that they have the best water in New York. <laughs> I know. York. They always um, think they have the best water the in best the world. Water. <laughs> the stuff comes out of the tap cloudy. That's marketing. How does that work? That's okay, marketing. So, that's, that, that's right. Um, and, and so last question uh, before we go, um, we sure. posted his LinkedIn here. Um, you all, our M4MM um, Facebook page posted that. So if you have any questions for Dr. Ali, if you want to get in contact with him, he's doing amazing work in this space. Uh, I know we talked about it on our phone call. Uh, what is your favorite vacation mm -hmm. spot, Dr. Ali? <laughs> My favorite vacation spot, well... Now, I, I, the first thing that came to mind was the state that I enter in prayer and meditation that I do every day. And that's my way of vacating the world and leaving it behind. So I remember who I am and where the source of all of my life comes from and all the opportunities in my life. Oh, that's but amazing. when I leave physically, geographically, my favorite places to go really are the, the Caribbean and Latin America. 
there's a connection I have with the cultures there, the music, the food, the, the people, the warmth of it. And there's a distinct difference. They might all be part of the Americas, but this part of North America, the U.S., and Canada are distinctly different than the rest. And Mexico is part of North America. People forget that. But yeah, I, I speak Spanish. And, and so I've, I've done lectures on cannabis and on cancer and, and other aspects of just human health uh, in, in other countries, Mexico, Venezuela, Colombia. And, you know, I love it there. I feel very much at home. It's kind of like Atlanta, but bigger. <laughs> to me, Atlanta is like the, the capital. Atlanta and Miami are like the capital of the Caribbean and Latin America. They just happen, you know, it's like an embassy. You know, yes, that's right. Miami that's is right. the Latin American embassy in the U.S. <laughs> and Atlanta is like the Caribbean embassy. Yes. And, uh, and yes. it's just something that happens. You know, you get off the plane in Atlanta and just go to a restaurant or just like a and little you club. You love seeing your people. You love seeing well, your people. and it's just, and people are healthy. And it's just... You know, they smile well, and all that, and it's like, well, wow. Dr. Leaf, uh, Dr. Leaf, I can't wait to join you on one of those islands or in one of those Spanish-speaking countries, tropical Spanish-speaking yeah, countries very soon. Thank you so much again, <laughs> you all. I've got my music playing, so I know it's time to Give go. Give me Soka. Yeah. I love my Soka. <laughs> we've, got, we've got, stay tuned, everyone. We've got So the Land coming up. Thank you again, Dr. Leaf. I really appreciate you participating Take today. Take care. Thank you. Um, Yes, no, thank you, sir. Everyone, stay tuned. Coming up next, we've got um, Stanley, the Canamedic, hosting So the Land this month for April. Um, if you're in the Arizona area, join me uh, in Chandler at the Crown Plaza for our Project Clean Slate today from 12 to 4. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Have a wonderful Saturday, and we'll see you again next month. Thanks so much.